Hi everybody, this is Bill Cloud, and I want to welcome you to this special teaching that we've entitled, And You Shall Know, Living in the Age of Redemption. The theme of this is going to be getting to know the Creator more than we ever have before. And let me kind of qualify that statement. For many years, I knew about God. I knew about Him from the stories that were told me, from the stories I read, what my parents told me, what others told me, taught me what I heard in Sunday school, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe that I have had in times past a relationship with God, but I'm living in a place now where I believe, and I'm speaking for myself, and I'm going to assume that this will resonate with others that are watching this, that I'm in a time and a place, I think we all are in a time and a place where our understanding of Him is growing more so, and we are perhaps transitioning from knowing about Him to truly getting to know Him. And I believe that because we are living in the age of redemption, that has a lot to do with it. In fact, I believe that there's a certain uh, degree of understanding God and getting to know Him that can only happen when we're living in the age of redemption. And so we're going to develop that as we go along over these uh, next several minutes while we do this teaching. But to begin with, let's go to the Gospel of John and kind of lay some groundwork here and read the words of the Messiah. And this is going to be found in John chapter 17. As we begin in verse 1, it says this, that Yeshua spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this next verse is what we really want to focus in on. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Yeshua the Messiah, whom you have sent. And so as we begin, let me just reemphasize what Yeshua just told us, that the definition of eternal life is to know the only true God and to know Yeshua the Messiah, whom the only true God sent. And so then, if I don't know Him, if I don't truly know Him, going beyond knowing about Him, then the question is, do I truly have eternal life? And if I do not know Yeshua the Messiah, truly and intimately know Him, more uh, as opposed to knowing about Him, do I have eternal life? And so that's, I believe, a very important place to start because all of us want to have eternal life. And so if we're going to experience eternal life, then it's critical that we truly know God and that we know the Messiah, Yeshua. Now, later on in the same chapter, Yeshua says this in verse 25 of chapter 17, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. So what I glean from that is that by knowing Messiah, that's how we come to know the Father. And let me kind of uh, interject this thought here. There's a lot of people who put a premium on studying God. By the way, the word theology means the study of God. But sometimes theology keeps us from truly knowing God. As a matter of fact, Messiah, in a manner of speaking, addressed that when he told a group of people that your traditions have made the word of God of none effect. In other words, the traditions of man, and if I can expound that to include sometimes our theology, our study of God, what we know about God, can sometimes make the word of God of none effect because we put such a premium on what we know here that we sometimes will neglect what's supposed to be going on within our hearts. So it's imperative that we know Messiah because He truly knows the Father. He displays and demonstrates and manifests the will of the Father. And He, dis he did this and does this through His actions. Um, specifically, the fact that He 
willingly lay down his life for the sake of us, for, for others, that he, he didn't allow someone to take his life. He said, I lay it down. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. So the, the, he does this. He demonstrates what the will of the Father is and he demonstrates who the Father is in that for God so loved the world, etc. So as we begin, once again, I want to say that we have, in times past, have known about God. And I'm not denying that we've had a relationship with God. I'm just saying that perhaps we're living in an age and time, the age of redemption, where our understanding of God, our knowledge of God, has to go beyond what we have experienced in times past. If our depth of relationship with Him has been sufficient to bring us to this point, but we're entering into, so to speak, our uncharted waters as it relates to what's going on in the world, might it be that the depth of relationship that we have enjoyed thus far may, may not be sufficient to carry us through what is coming in the days, weeks, months, and years ahead? especially if we believe that we're living in the age of redemption. And we're going to get into how we know that we're living in the age of redemption in just a little bit. But coming back to my point, if we have come to a place that it's now required that we know Him more so than we ever have, and that we go from knowing about Him to truly knowing Him, then that is going to be demonstrated to us through the Messiah. So we really need to know the Messiah if we're going to know the Father. To just quote verses, to know Hebrew, to know what the rabbi said about this topic or that topic, and all those things, great, marvelous, and wonderful. However, that doesn't necessarily translate into knowing Him. It might be just knowing about Him. And so once again, the Messiah said, the world has not known you. And when we think of the world, I know that we think of the secular people, we think of the godless people, but sometimes the world, we find, has crept into the body and influences the body. And the, the world has not known the Father. But he says, I have known you. And he says, and these that you have sent me. And I realize that ultimately, uh, and at least primarily there, he was speaking of those 12, one of which was a devil, but those disciples that had been following him around all those years. But I would say that this includes you and me. And so it's through the Messiah that we come to know the Father. Now, we want to go to Matthew chapter 11 now. We're going to read another very important portion of Scripture here. And I know you've read this before, but in Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, listen to what Messiah says. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal it. I don't think that could be any clearer. He says that no one knows the Father except the Son. And if you know the Son, truly know Him, then the Son reveals the Father to you. So again, that tells me that in, in spite of the fact that I love to study the Word, and, and I'm an advocate for studying the Word, I love to study prophecy and, and Hebrew and all those kinds of things, but if we're not careful, our pursuit of knowledge can lead us away from the Son. And our pursuit of knowledge, if it leads us away from the Son, can lead us away from truly knowing the Father. Because if we're going to take Yeshua's words as fact, then He says that He is the one who reveals the Father to those that He wills to do it. Now, another very uh, important and very uh, well-known verse is found in Matthew chapter 7. And it starts out in verse 19, he says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by your fruits you will know them. And, and so we, we know people by the fruit that they produce, not necessarily what they say, but what they do. How is their lifestyle? Uh, how is their demeanor, their disposition, their attitude, etc.? Now, he goes on and he says this in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And some of you may know that that Greek term there is anomia. Anomia is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Torah. And so anomia means without Torah. So lawlessness is without Torah. That is God's instructions for living, which is kind of odd when you consider that they're making the claim to have prophesied in Yeshua's name, to have cast out devils in Yeshua's name, to have done many other wonderful, wonderful works in his name. And yet he says, I don't know you. I never knew you. So again, that goes to tell us that we can know about him and we can do things that pertain to him and it still be possible to never know him. And so that's why we want to address this issue of, and you shall know. That is to say, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Throughout Scripture, we're going to share several examples of this in our teaching, but throughout the Scripture, the Creator continually tells His people, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And particularly when I do this, and when I perform this wonder, and this miracle, and when you see this, then you shall know that I am the Lord. And by the way, he makes the case that, and the nations are going to know that I am the Lord. But here, back to the, the point here in Matthew 7, there are people who think they know him. But he says he didn't. He didn't know them. And, and so how tragic it is to believe and to think that you know him because you do this or because you study that and because you know how to pronounce this and, and you know not to do that and then find out you really didn't know me. So how is it that he calls them to be without Torah? Because that would imply that if you do his instructions and keep his commandments, then you would know him. True. So that leads us to think that maybe in doing the things that God says to do, the things that God said not to do, that it's really important that we embrace the weightier matters of the Torah, as Yeshua called it. He, he told a group of people, you tithe, mint, cumin, anise, these things. And by the way, you should do those things, he says. But in doing those things, don't omit the weightier matters of the Torah, things like mercy, justice, faith, those invisible things, those things that no one sees. Those are the, well, the word weighty, the equivalent in Hebrew of that word would be kavod. Kavod means weighty, but that's also the Hebrew word for glory. And so the more glorious matters of the Torah are not necessarily what men see, but what men do not see and what God does see. Mercy, justice, faith, these invisible things. And so my point here is that in our pursuit to keep God's instructions, let's make sure that we understand that this is all about getting to know Him, not just to know about Him, to know His heart. Because in following His instructions, if we don't see His heart in this, and if we don't, as His people, demonstrate and, and reflect what is in his heart to others, then might it be that we're no better than those who prophesy in his name and who cast out devils in his name and do all these other wonderful works in his name, but tragically never knew him, never connected our hearts with his heart. Now, that's going to take us over to the book of Exodus in chapter 34, where we see the Creator actually um, describing Himself to Moses. So it's found in Exodus chapter 34, and, and this is after the, uh, the golden calf incident, of course, when the people sinned a great sin. But in Exodus 34, we'll begin in verse 5, it says, now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him, that is Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, 
merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And so Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. All right, now here's why I wanted to read this. We know, according to his own declaration here, the Lord says that he does not ignore or clear the guilty, that he visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation, all right? But we're also told that he extends mercy to those who love him and keep his commandments to the thousandth generation. And in other teachings, we've made this point that when you take three or four generations and then you compare it to a thousand generations, if you were to put those in separate trays on a scale, the scale of justice, as we'll call it, tilts overwhelmingly toward the fact that he's merciful, that he is gracious, he's long-suffering, he abounds in goodness and truth, and he keeps mercy for thousands, he forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. In other words, he is much more willing to forgive sin than he is to judge sin. He doesn't shrink away from judging sin when necessary, but he would much rather have the opportunity to forgive people of their sin, to extend mercy, to be long-suffering and gracious. And so, by the Creator's own mouth, He describes Himself to Moses and to us as being merciful, long-suffering, compassionate. In other words, if we truly know Him, who He is, what He is, then we should reflect that. And so it's not going to be enough, as far as I can see in the Scripture, to know about Him, to quote this, to be able to say, well, this is how they did that. That's all well and good, and it has its place. But if you're hearing what I'm saying, and I hope that your spiritual ears are open to my message here, that we can do and say all of those other things, but if we never really reflect His graciousness, His long-suffering, His mercy, his, his compassion, His willingness to forgive us, and so we go out and forgive others, then might it be said that we really didn't know Him. And given the fact that He is expressing this to Moses, that brings me to this question. Did they, that is, of that generation, Moses, Aaron, those who left Egypt, how well did they really know him? Now, individually, we could say Moses knew him pretty well. God spoke to him face to face as a man speaks to a friend. There are others who knew him very well. But of those that came out of Egypt, how many actually entered into the land? And so, again, that begs the question, how many of them really knew him. And so with that thought, we're going to go now to Ezekiel 20. And from what we just read in Exodus, we're going to, that's going to go into the future from, from Moses' generation. And we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 20. And I'm going to read some uh, very important scripture here. And I'm going to read quite a bit. And, and so just kind of stay with me here for a moment. But in Ezekiel 20, um, the people of Judah are in Babylonian captivity. And Ezekiel is there with them in captivity. And so it's, it says in verse 1, It came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. So they're wanting to ask God a question by going to Ezekiel the prophet. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Have you come to inquire of me? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Will you judge them, son of man? Will you judge? Then make known to them the abominations of their fathers and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, On the day when I chose Israel and raised my hand in an oath to the descendants of the house of Jacob, and I want to underscore this, and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, I raised my hand and note to them, saying, I am the Lord your God. So let's pause here. He is speaking to these elders of Israel through Ezekiel the prophet, and he is recounting or beginning to recount what happened when the people of Israel were still in Egypt, before the exodus out of Egypt. And he says this, 
He says that I made myself known to them in the land of Egypt. He said, I am the Lord your God. And so I've always had this question. You would assume that the sons of Jacob who were in Egypt knew God. They certainly knew about him. But he seems to suggest they didn't really know him because why would he have to say, and I made myself known to them if they really knew him? Why did he have to remind them that I am the Lord your God? And so I could make the case that in reality, a lot of them, while they knew about him, didn't really know him because if they had known them, then he would not have had to say this beginning in verse 6. On that day, I raised my hand in an oath to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had searched out for them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands. And then I said to them, listen to this, each of you throw away the abomination which, is before, which are before his eyes and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Okay, here's my point. If they had really known him, then number one, he would not have had to make himself known to them. Number two, if they had really known him, then he would not have had to encourage them to remove the abominations which are before your eyes. Don't defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. He doesn't have to say that if they weren't doing that. So obviously, living in Egypt for all this time at some point opened the door for Egypt to begin to live in them. Or if we can put it this way, as I said earlier, sometimes the world that has not known the Father creeps into the body and influences the body. And maybe the body ends up, in some cases anyway, saying, we prophesied in your name, we cast out devils in your name, we did all these wonderful works in your name. But to hear him say, I didn't know you. So I hope you're following me here. Once again, he doesn't have to tell them to get rid of the idols of Egypt unless they had idols of Egypt. I think that the golden calf incident actually bears this out even more so because, well, I'm of the opinion that more than worshiping an Egyptian idol, what the children of Israel did at the foot of Mount Sinai in the golden calf incident was to take an idol of Egypt and have it represent the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, mingling holy and profane, if you will. Nevertheless, the result is the same, because had they really known him, they would have taken him and his word to heart when he said, I'm the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Therefore, you are to have no other gods before me, no graven images of anything that's in the earth, like a calf, or in the sky or the, or the seas. In fact, they said, whatever the Lord says, we will hear and do. But it really wasn't in their heart because they were conflicted. They knew about God, but they also had these things pertaining to Egypt that were holding on to them and that they were holding on to. So all of this is to say that the people of God, the children of Israel living in Egypt, also had Egypt living in them. And so they knew about God, but how well did they know him? Apparently, not so well that he didn't have to say, and I made myself known to you. I am the Lord your God. Put away the abominations. Get rid of these idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And so now we're going to go back to, the, uh, to Ezekiel 20 here. Uh, beginning in verse 8, But they rebelled against me and would not obey me, they did not all cast away the abominations which were, which were before their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them, the them being the children of Israel. Where were they when he says this? In the midst of the land of Egypt. So while they were in Egypt, he said, I poured out my fury on them not referring to the Egyptians here, but referring to his own people. And here's why he did it. Verse 9, But I acted for my name's sake, that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles among whom they were, in whose sight I had made myself known to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So, again, my case here that I'm trying to make is that God's people knew about him. They didn't really know him. Now, why is it important for you and me to 
connect with this and to understand this, to even embrace this. Because if you want to understand what's going on in the end, you have to understand what's going on or what happened in the beginning. We've talked about this multiple times. Isaiah 46 gives us an example of this. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3 gives us an example of this. So we understand what's going on today, most importantly, what God is doing in the earth today, because surely the Lord God does nothing except He first reveal His secret unto His servants, the prophets. So we understand what God is doing in the earth today by understanding what has already been. In short, I believe that God establishes patterns in His Word that are intended to speak to you and me today. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, and I'm going to paraphrase this, he, he recounts all the things that happened to the children of Israel in the wilderness after they came out of Egypt, how they all ate the same food, all drank the same drink. They drank of that rock, which was Messiah. But then he goes into all the things that befall them because of their sexual immorality, their tempting Messiah, their unbelief, their grumble, grumbling and complaining. And then he says this, he says, these things were written as an example unto those of us upon whom the ends of the age have come. In other words, here's a pattern, and you need to pay attention to this pattern because, you see, he went on to say, let everyone take heed because if you think you're standing and you don't take heed to these things, you may find that you will fall. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is really what we're going to get into now, is that we want to understand the pattern that is established so we can understand where we're at. But we're going to pause here, and we're going to come back and pick up in our next segment.